Hi, I'm Phil Lowe. This is the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts, and this is the Art of Woodworking. So in this episode, what I'd like to do is show you how to prepare a piece of wood that is actually going to go into a piece of furniture with some hand planes. And uh, one of the things that we need to do in order to prepare this piece of wood correctly is to uh, have a, a plane that's good and sharp. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to uh, talk about the parts of this particular plane. And then I'm going to show you how to, to grind the iron, hone it, and uh, show you how to adjust this plane so that it works perfectly. So it really takes the effort out of uh, hand planing. So to start with, what I'd like to do is just uh, uh, show you the, 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 uh, the plane. And if you look at uh, you know, this, uh, uh, this cap lever, um, if we lift up this lever here, what that does is that releases uh, the cap itself. And then we take the blade assembly out. And the blade assembly is made up of two uh, pieces. It's the, the blade itself, which is this piece here. And then we also have what they call a chip breaker. And the chip breaker actually will turn the shaving as it's coming out of the throat of the plane. Now the other parts of the plane, if we want to zoom in a little closer here, I'll show you, uh, we have the uh, frog which is what the, uh, the blade assembly actually sits on. We have the uh, cap uh, screw, which uh, the cap um, actually has a cam that levers down onto the surface. Uh, we have this lateral adjustment. What this will do is this will actually move the uh, blade from side to side so that we get an even projection of the blade out through the, the, uh, the throat of the plane. Then we also have these, uh, this knob and what they call a yoke. And the yoke actually goes up through the frog and you see this little pin on the top. When this is moved back and forth, this, uh, the, 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 the yoke itself actually moves back and forth which projects the blade further out or pulls it back inside the plane. Then we have what they call the tote or a lot of people might call the handle. We have the, uh, the knob, this is a low profile knob on this one. Then we have the sole of the plane and then the throat. Now, when we go to sharpen a plane, there's uh, two, uh, two things involved in that. There's grinding of the blade, and then there's also honing of the blade. And I'm going to get a little graphic here, and I'm going to show you what the differences are. When we uh, grind, we actually have a, a round wheel uh, that when a blade is put up against it, because of the, uh, the circumference of the wheel and the curvature that it makes over a certain distance, it creates what we call a hollow grind. And the table is what we actually rest the uh, blade against while we push it up against the, the wheel in order to make a very consistent cut all the way across the blade. Once the blade has been hollow ground, we take it to a stone. And if you'll notice in this graphic here that the, the hollow uh, of the grind will actually have the blade touch on the very point of the blade and on the heel of the blade with this little space in between. And as this gets worn down, what happens is that's how we're able to hold the blade at a correct angle on the stone without losing the proper angle. And uh, when, we, when we grind the blade though, we also will do two things. We'll, uh, a chisel will get ground with a straight grind across and uh, a, a, a blade will actually have a crown on it. And the reason why we have the crown on it is that if we don't put the curvature into the blade, when the blade cuts into the surface of a piece of wood, we'll actually have these little ridges on, the, on each side, which will uh, show up in the finish. Whereas if we have a crown on the blade, you can see these undulations that'll go across the, uh, the surface of the board and those plane marks won't show up as much. 
And then, of course, we introduced the uh, scrub plane last uh, episode, and this has a really extreme curve on the blade so we can re remove material from the surface or the edge of a board extremely quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the grinder and I'm going to grind uh, not only this blade uh, the, for the number four plane, but I'm also going to grind a chisel to show you the difference between the two. So we'll go ahead over here. All right, when we go to grind the, uh, you know, a blade or a chisel, um, I usually like to use a grinder. And like I said before, um, the wheel will actually leave, you know, a curvature into the, uh, the edge of this. Now, the type of grinder that I like to use is one that is a slow speed, which is only uh, 1,800 RPMs, where a normal grinder will be about 3,600 RPMs. And the reason why we do that is that the, uh, the wheel will actually spin slower and it'll keep the blade a lot cooler than having you know, a, a you know, piece of stone rub against the blade so uh, quickly that it heats it up so fast. And one of the things that we have to be careful of is to make sure that we don't take the temper out of the blade. And what that means is if we start to turn this blue or turns cherry red and we let it uh, air cool, the hardness of the blade will disappear and it'll be very difficult to, um, to keep the, uh, the edge on the, on the tool. Um, when we adjust this now, uh, what I do is I usually will grab the, the tool like a spider, so I grab it uh, in this situation like this, and I put it flat on the table, and I'll push this up against the wheel, and I'll check it from the side, like so, to see how close I am to the angle that I want. And if I need to micro adjust this, what I've done is I've tightened this nut on the, on the grinder just firm enough so that if I tap this down here, this will tilt the table down, which will make you know, this bevel actually longer by dropping it down this way. If I tap it up on the top, it'll actually move the blade in this direction, which will shorten up this, uh, this, uh, the length of this bevel. Now this bevel needs to be anywhere from 25 to 30 degrees, depending on the type of wood that you use. Uh, like if we, we're doing maple, with planing maple or something like that, uh, that's a really hard material. So we'd want to have a steeper angle on here. And if uh, we're planing a lot of pine or something soft, we can get away with a little uh, uh, shallower angle. But the thing is that we want to be careful of is if, if we get this too th shallow, what happens is this comes down to a very thin uh, thickness at the very end and turns into a piece of tin foil so that when we actually go to push the, the blade into the wood, the edge of the blade will actually collapse and will you know, completely dull and leave uh, nicks on the, uh, the surface of the blade. So in order to get this, uh, you know, this bevel the correct size, there's a couple ways that we, I look at this. If I take the thickness of the blade and make that two times the, the length of the bevel, that's approximately 30 degrees. So if I look at the, the distance, from the edge to the heel, and if I put a line in the middle, you know, the distance from the middle to the edge is about one thickness of the blade. So that's one way, easy way, to sort of figure out, you know, what the length of that bevel needs to be. So I'm going to put this on here. I turn this on, and I usually touch it to the, to the wheel. And if you look really closely now, you can see that right here, there's a, a little grind that's just touching along the very edge of the tool, which means that when I grind this, it's actually going to be a little steeper. So I'm going to try to get that grind to end up right in the middle of the blade to begin with. So I'm going to tap this down and then touch it again. And if you look here, you can see that it's almost in the center. And one more touch, and that looking pretty good right there. Now, the thing that I have to do is I have to try to pass this across the edge of the, the wheel, you know, nice and smoothly so that I, do, I don't get an irregular cut. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this, make sure that I'm pushing against the table, and start off in the corner, and just bring this back and forth like so. And every couple of cuts, what I'll do is I'll dip this into cool water to keep the, the, the tool as, as cool as possible. 
and we're making a little bit of progress now. You can see that the shiny spots are starting to disappear, and once those disappear, I'm at the, uh, you know, it, I have the right bevel that I need. Okay, almost there. All right, now one of the things that I have to do is I have to check for that crown that I was talking about a little earlier. So if, what I do is I grab a, a combination square, and if I hold the blade so that the flat surface is towards me, and I hold it up like so, and I look up at the light, I can actually see that this has a little bit of light on each corner and depending on how much light actually shows through will tell you how much curvature is there is there and if you have too much what happens when you install this back into the plane is that the shaving will actually come out narrower and the wider it is or the the the, sh the shallower the curve the wider the shaving so that's really what we're we're looking for so this looks uh, pretty good. I'm going to just hold that right there so you can get a good sh close shot of it. Uh, you can see the nice even grind all the way across. And uh, at this point, since I'm at the grinder, I'm going to go ahead and grind my uh, chisel as well. Um, now this is an inch and a quarter wide chisel, bench chisel, and um, I've already started grinding this, but really what we're looking for here is that the the chisel, instead of it having a crown on it, we want it to be completely square this way and straight. You know, because if we don't have it um, straight across the curve, we're not able to make you know good even cuts across the uh, surface of the board. So I'm go, going to go ahead and touch this to the wheel, change my angle slightly, and. We'll go ahead and grind that. Until the hollow comes right out to the very edge into the heel. Actually looking pretty good. Just slight adjustment there. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take these over to the bench and grab my whetstones and I'm gonna show you how to hone these. All right, the, uh, what I'm gonna show you how to do first is to sharpen a, uh, a bench chisel. And this is the uh, one where I ground it straight across. And we talked about the hollow that we have in here now. Now, one of the things that's really important when we sharpen is that the, uh, the, uh, the back of the tool is completely flat. And one of the things that can happen when we're sharpening is that the, t the stone can go out of flat. And what I mean by that is that if you look at this, uh, these old uh, oil stones that I have, uh, I've used these for years and you know they eventually wear. So if you look at this ruler when I put it across here, you can see that there's quite a space underneath here. So if I rub my tool across you know, that surface, what it's gonna do to the blade is it's gonna round it off. And that's not really very good uh, especially for a bench plane because what happens is that when we put the, the cap or the, uh, the chip breaker on there, it creates a space underneath here. And this is the reason why you find all of these old planes on the shelf jammed full of shavings because the guy can't figure out what they need to do in order to fix it. And one of the things you need to do is to make sure that you get the back of the blade flat and that the chip breaker is in contact with the back of the blade um, as best as it can be. So when we go to sharpen now, uh, one of the things that we do is we, uh, we put a little water on these, uh, these water stones and we have a flattening uh, plate. This is a diamond plate that we run across here to make sure that the stones are perfectly flat.
Now, what we'll do is we'll clean that off and we'll start sharpening. Now when we sharpen, what we have to do is we have to try to balance the tool on the heel and also on the, uh, the very edge. Now when you think about this, you know, when we took this to the grinder, what happens is that we have this you know, revolving wheel that uh, cuts away the metal, but it's making all these little indentations on, the, on this surface. And if I took a magnifying glass and looked at the very edge of this, it would be like a sawtooth and it'd be very ragged. And the idea is that if we can eliminate those scratches as best as possible, that's what's going to give us our sharpest edge. So we'll put this on here. We rock this back and forth until we find the, uh, the tool is sitting on um, both the edge and the heel and we push it across there. And what you'll notice is that there's two lines and what's going on here is it's wearing on the heel and it's wearing on the the very edge so if we keep doing that back and forth what it's going to do is it's going to wear away on the very edge and the heel until we have these two shiny spots going across the heel and all the way across the edge now a couple of things that another thing I want to just talk a, a minute about is that there are a couple of different types of stones or they're they're all similar stones that we have here but what we what's the difference is we have different grades of stones we have a thousand grit stone we have a 5,000 grit stone we have an 8,000 grit stone and we also have a 16,000 grit stone which is this white one here so what we'll do is we'll bring these through the, uh, the, all the evolution and since I have this thousand grit stone here now I might as well go to the plain iron and we'll sharpen that as well. Now one of the tricks about this is since we put a curvature on this on this bevel we you know when we push this put this up against here and push in the middle what's going to happen is it's only going to sharpen right down the very center and I don't know if you can see that or not but you can see a shiny spot there and a shiny spot there that only go over to these two points and that's because of the curvature of the blade now if we put our fingers at the very corner and push and pull a couple of times and do that again on the opposite corner we're going to get a nice even shine all the way across and that ensures that the blade is being sharpened all the way across and we're not, we're not going to have any dull spots. Now the other thing that we have to do is we have to make sure we flatten the back. What happens is when we, when we hone the surface, we turn a burr on the back side and we have to take that burr off of the back by running this across here. And now you see all this, this gray slurry that's on the stone. That's actually metal coming off of the blade and uh, that's what's actually getting cut away and we don't want to do too much of this because the more we, sh we hone the, the more we wear away the heel and the more we wear away the very edge and when those two shiny spots starts to collapse and, and touch in the middle that's when we have to uh, go to the grinder again and, uh, and put a new fresh grind into it Okay, I got to do the back of this one. And once, twice more here. And now we'll go ahead on to another stone, which is the, the pink one, which is the 4,000 or 5,000 grit. And we usually flatten these every time we use them. So we'll just take the uh, diamond plate. And we'll go ahead and continue until we go through all four stones. We'll go ahead and do the backs. the edge and 
that's feeling pretty good. Go on to the next, which is the green stone, which is an 8,000 grit. Go ahead and flatten that. Ooh. All right, let's see what we can do with this. Okay, now we'll go ahead and do the back of this. All right, and we'll go on to the 16,000 grit. So this is an extremely fine stone. And one of the things you'll notice here is that if this is, if you can tell how flat the stone is sometimes by, you can pick, actually pick up the stone, that's how flat the back of the chisel is. Go ahead and do the final edge. And we should be done. Get rid of some of this. Okay. Now, when we finish honing these, the backs of these should be so highly polished, they're almost like a mirror. You might be able to see the reflection of the camera right in the back of the surface here. And if you look at the front or the edge, you'll notice that there's two shiny lines going across, you know, the very edge of this. And that's what's going to give us the most, the sharpest edge that we can get. Okay, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Uh, then I'm going to show you how to set up the plane and I'm going to talk, to talk to you a little bit about some wood. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reassemble the plane so that we can get it uh, working. So we need to take this chip breaker. And when I uh, spoke before, um, if we put this chip breaker on sideways like this and then slide it back and then turn it to the side, you know, we're, we're not going to drag this chip breaker across the edge, which could damage the edge and make a little chip which would be noticeable when we actually start to plane. So uh, one of the things we look for here is when we put the chip breaker about a 32nd of an inch away from the end of the blade, and we look through these right into this space in here, if I can see light in there, what will happen is the shaving will come up and get jammed in between the blade and the chip breaker and that'll you know, in, inhibit the, uh, the functioning of the plane. So I want to make sure that that's uh, perfectly seated against the back of the blade, and I usually check that every time I, uh, I sharpen. Now I'm going to go ahead and tighten this up. I want to make sure that the chip breaker is on there good and square, and we'll snug that up. And now what we're going to do is we'll slide this into the body of the plane onto the top of the frog, and we want to make sure that the pin from the yoke is going into this little slot here and we want to be careful that we don't nick the edge when we're putting it together and then we want to make sure that the lateral adjustment there's a little bearing on the end of this that you see there that has to go into this groove on the blade and then we'll go ahead and assemble this tighten that down and when I go to set the uh, the blade what I'm going to do is I'm going to sight right along you know the bottom of this like this here all right and I'm going to project the blade until I can actually see it coming out through through the uh, the bottom and I'm going to project this a little heavy and I'm going to push it off to one side and if we hold a piece of paper up behind this uh, I'm hoping that you might be able to see the adjustment on this if, if you can see that, you should be able to see that the blade is sticking out through the, 
the throat and it's higher on one side than it is on the other. Now in order to take care of that, that, uh, that misalignment, I'll actually take the lateral adjustment and move it from side to side. Now you notice that it's going to push it over to the other side. So when I adjust this, I want to look down along the plane this way and adjust that until it's about equal all the way across. And then I'm going to pull the iron back inside of the, of the throat so that there's no cut at all. And then I'm going to get a sample piece of wood that I can start to make a uh, shaving with. We'll use this one that we used last time. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to adjust the blade as I, um, as I run this across this piece of wood. So you notice that it's making a very shallow cut. And that's actually not too bad. You'll notice that those are so fine that they'll, you know, they'll basically float to the floor. And if I turn this clockwise, I'll actually project the blade out just a bit more. And you notice that the shaving is a little bit heavier. So this is ready to go now. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is just talk to you a little bit about wood and some of the defects and things that, uh, you know, we come up against when we go to the lumber yard to uh, pick out a piece of uh, lumber. Okay, what I'd like to do first of all is talk to you about the, uh, the parts of a tree to begin with. And uh, this is a cross section that you can see that I have labeled. And if we work it from the uh, outside towards the center, uh, you'll notice that I have the bark indicated here, which is uh, the distance from this black line over. We have the cambium layer, which is just the, on the inside of the, uh, the bark. And then we have, if you look uh, closely, you can see the coloration of this uh, material right in through here is lighter. And that's what's known as the sapwood. And then we have the darker wood, which is on the inside here, which is known as the heartwood. And then we also have, um, you know, in science class, I'm sure everybody, you know, learned about, you know, this cross section of the tree. We have the annual rings and each ring grows once a year. So I could count up these rings and tell you how old this tree is. We also have, in this particular piece, this is a piece of white oak, uh, you can see what uh, is, indicates the medullary rays. And these are these radiating rays that come out uh, from the center of the tree, and those basically hold the, uh, the straws of the vessels together. And then at the very center of the tree is the pith, and that was the first annual ring that started to grow when this was just a tiny shoot. So that, you know, if we counted these up, it's probably a good 60 to 100 year old tree that we're looking at here. Now, uh, how do we equate this to um, a lumber? You know, we talked about, you know, cutting pieces into uh, boards last uh, week with pit saws and so forth. You know, commercially they cut uh, pieces and they do it a couple of different ways. They do plane sawing where they would take this tree and they would just put it onto the mill and they just cut it straight across this way. And that's what's known as plane sawn lumber. Then they would also cut it across and into quarters and then come in from the sides. That would be quarter sawn lumber. And then if you cut it into quarters and cut it uh, you know, diagonally this way, that's what would be known as rifts on lumber. So uh, when you buy a piece of wood at the lumber yard, you know, you, you, most of the time you're buying plain sawn lumber. So I'll show you an example of that. <clears throat> now a piece of plain sawn lumber, you can tell by the annual rings that you can see on the surface. If you are looking at a quarter sawn piece of lumber, you would see Uh, if you look at the annual rings on the end, these are going to be perpendicular to the surface. And in a piece of oak, you'll see the medullary rays displayed on the surface of the board as well. And you'll see no annual rings, but you'll see these splashes of uh, medullary rays on the surface. Now, when we talk about a board, you know, there's some terminology that we use. You know, the two broad surfaces, uh, this surface here and this surface here, we have the edges of a board, which are, you know, the two uh, opposing surfaces. And then the ends of the boards are when we look at the annual rings 
or when it comes, this is how it came out of the log this way here. So this is the end of the board. Now we also have to talk about the length of the board, the width of the board, and the thickness of the board. So, you know, those are very basic terms that you have to know if you're going to work in a shop and some, somebody says, you know, go rip a board to this width. So we're talking about, you know, something in this dimension and not in the length or in the thickness. So uh, those are ver really basic things that you have to understand. So, but when we go off to the lumber yard, a lot of times what we find is that there's defects in lumber. And, um, you know, one of the first defects that we usually come across when we look at a board is what we call a cup. And a cup in a board is actually a curvature that occurs from when it's dried. And if it's, this piece of wood is put into a kiln, which is like a big oven, uh, you know, it dries out. And because of the annual rings and how they're cut, this ends up getting, uh, you know, a bit of a space in here. And it's concave on that side and convex on this side. And, you know, one of the problems with that is if we were trying to get a certain thickness out of the board, we'd have to plane so much off of one side, especially this wide piece, would end up with something that's extremely thin. So that's one thing that we have to look out for. Then we have to look out for what they call a crook. And if you could focus on this large board here, you know, you, you can see how this came out of the tree. This is the uh, cambium layer here, or what sometimes is called the wane. But the crook is actually the shape of the board in this direction. You know, in order to get a straight board out of this, we'd have to cut a, you know, a bunch of way on this side and a lot of way on this side to get a, end up with a really narrow board. Then we also have what they call a bow, which is in this direction here. And if we look down whoop, along this board here, like this, and we sight this this way, you can actually see that the board has a curve over its length on the surface, like so. And, you know, in order to, uh, you know, get a flat board out of this, it would be very difficult because of the, uh, the amount of bow that's in it. Now, there's a couple other defects that occur uh, when things are dried as well, and that's what we call a twist. And a twist is actually when the board has warped so badly that you can't really, you know, use this board unless we cut it into really small pieces. So, you know, this is a very, un, you know, non-usable piece if we were trying to get a, you know, a thickness out of this length. Now, some of the other defects uh, that most people have probably heard about, you know, you have to try to avoid knots in the board, which are, you know, this happens to be a piece of pine, and each one of these knots is where a branch comes out of the side of the tree. And then we also have uh, what they call checking, which you can see in this piece of walnut. There's a couple of different types of checking here. There's a long longitudinal check in this direction, but there's also what they call scaling here. This is a highly figured piece of wood, and the grain is starting to lift and split apart in that section. So these are all things that we're trying to avoid when we pick out a piece of, a piece of wood. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to show you how to flatten the surface of a board with a plane. And then uh, we're going to go on to squaring some edges, ends, and uh, making the other side perfectly parallel just using hand tools. So let me set up here. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how to uh, flatten out one surface of this board to begin with. And, you know, when we go to plane the board, we have to make sure that we plane in the proper direction. And there's a saying in woodworking, uh, in order to find uh, the correct direction of the grain when you go to plane, is the heart points the way. And what I mean by that is if you look at the end of the board, meaning, and you see the annual rings, and if you can see where the inside of the tree is or the, the, the surface that's closest to the pith would be this surface here. And if you look at the surface, um, you know, on uh, an annual, uh, you know, a plain slice piece, you'll see these, see these uh, the grain pointing in a direction. So if I'm going to plane this board, these annual rings are actually pointing in the direction that I need to plane only on the surface that has the, uh, you know, that's closest to the uh, center of the tree. If I turn this over, this is actually pointing in the same direction, but if I planed in this direction, I'd be going against the grain 
and it would lift up the grain and it would leave a uh, surface that's, uh, you know, that's been torn. Uh, and a torn surface is, you know, very rough and, uh, you know, it's not very desirable. So uh, when I look at this particular piece, I'll go ahead and look for the inside of the tree, which is here. And um, if I can see the annual rings on the surface here, it looks like it, they're going in this direction. So I'm going to hold this in my vise this way. Now, because this, uh, you know, this piece is, isn't very flat, a couple of things that we have to do in order to get the maximum thickness out of this is we have to check the board for flatness with a straight edge. So if we hold the ruler on the surface this way and then go from side to side, you can notice that you, know, you can see light underneath the ruler here and here. And then if I hold it in the opposite direction, you can see that as well. And it will actually rock as well. So um, let me just grab a piece of paper here. So what can happen is when we, uh, you know, put the ruler on the board this way and from corner to corner and from side to side, what we're doing is we're determining the shape of the board. So if I, you know, you, the board can be shaped like this. It can have a hollow in the center, which is the opposite side. It can have a twist in the board, meaning that these two corners could be coming up like this. Uh, they could also be going in the opposite direction, meaning that the shape of the board is like this as well. And if we, you know, hold our hold our uh, ruler across there. You know, it's looking pretty flat this way, but when we put it across in this direction, these corners are falling off. So these are some preliminary things that we have to do uh, as far as trying to check the surface of the board so we know where to plane this, the material away. So, And when I go to start this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use uh, a, a series of planes. I'm going to use the scrub plane, which will remove the material really fast. Then I'm going to go to a jack plane, which is a, a coarser blade, but a little flatter. And then I'm going to finish it off with a smooth plane. So I'm going to go ahead and start here. Now, one thing that's going to help me here, as far as the effort goes, if I put a little paraffin wax on the bottom of my plane, it'll actually make it run across the surface a little smoother. And it takes a little of the drudgery away. Now, once I get fairly close like that, I'll go ahead and to the jack plane, make sure that my blade is adjusted correctly. And I'm going to go ahead and start planing with this. And you'll notice that the, the shavings are a little wider and a little thicker. And I want to start to check for flatness now. So I'm going to check this way. A little light underneath here, a little light underneath there. Actually, the blade, the, the board is shaped like this now, where these edges are coming up. This has fallen off this way. So in order to correct that, I'll go ahead and plane from corner to corner. I'm going to back off on this blade just a little bit. Help myself out here a little. Okay, let's check that again. Falling off a little there, that's pretty good. This is falling off a little, so we go in the opposite direction now. And once we get to that point, we'll go ahead and start with the uh, smooth plane. Make sure that this is cutting well. So go ahead, and this should be the final cut, making sure that the board is perfectly flat. You notice how I'm making good even cuts all the way across. And you know we put the uh, ruler on there, it's perfectly flat from corner to corner and across the surface this way. So this is a, 
a flat plane surface. And one of the ways that we mark that uh, so that we know that we've taken care of that surface is we put a big squirrel mark on that. Now the next thing that we have to do is we have to plane the edge of a board. And if we look at the, uh, the grain here, it's pretty straight, but it tends to come off in this direction. We're going to plane this board in you know, this direction here. And what we're looking for on the edge now is to get the board perfectly straight. And then also with the combination square, we want it to be square to the surface that we've already planed. Now, if this surface isn't particularly, you know, isn't completely flat, and let's just say it sort of falls off on the corner, when we put the square across here, what's going to happen is the square is going to get tilted like this uh, because that surface isn't flat. And you're going to end up with a surface that actually has a twist in it. Now, the other thing that we're going to try and do here is to make sure that you know, when we plane the surface, you know, this surface could have a, 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 you know, a hump in it like this. It could have a concave surface. It can be twisted, um, you know, a number of different things. And one of the beautiful things about, you know, this blade having the curve in it is we can adjust the uh, angle of the edge of the board by just shifting the plane around from side to side. So when I start here, I'm going to go ahead and just run this across like so. Get rid of the roughness. Now I'm going to go ahead and check for straight this way here. Now that's looking good and straight. And then we also want to make sure that it's square. Now I usually hold this up to the light. And what I'm seeing here is that this edge right here is actually angled up this way. So if you think about, you know, the blade in the plane now, and it has this curve on it this way, like this, that's the shape of the blade exaggerated. If I take the, the plane and I shift it over to the side, what happens, it's cutting deeper in the middle than it is on the edge because of the curvature. So if I move this over and run this along here, what you're going to see is I have a shaving that's actually thicker on the right hand side than it is the left. So I've micro adjusted this so it's, you know, getting, you know, put into square a little closer. Now I always have to work off of the reference surface. And that's perfectly square. Now, if this wasn't perfectly square, when I do, well, when it is square, what I do is I mark it this way. And this surface now relates to this, the, uh, the ends. So when I go ahead and check this for, for square on the ends this way, if this had a, has a concave in it, which means in this direction, what will happen is the, the, the square will be held on an angle this way. If it has a convex curve on it, it'll hold the square in this direction. And what will happen is we'll actually make boards that are actually tapering on the ends. So it's really important to make sure that the edge of this is perfectly straight and square. So now we're going to go ahead on, on to the ends. And these are the most difficult parts to plane because we have to make sure that the board is square this way. But we also have to make sure it's square in this direction. And one of the uh, other things that, uh, pr that can be a problem is if we plane all the way across, if we catch this edge, it'll have a tendency to chip out. So we have to, you know, restrain our cuts and only go part way across. And then back in from the other direction. Then we'll check that for square off of the edge that we've already planed. That looks pretty good. And square in this direction. Now we'll do the same thing to the opposite end. Okay, now that I have these, uh, this board, uh, one surface flattened, the ends straight and square, the ends square and square, what I need to do now is make the opposite edge parallel. So I'm going to hold this in the vise 
and I'm going to take out uh, my knife and I'm going to score a line along the edge here. I'm going to set this up this way. And if I take my square and extend this over, now if I was shooting for a particular dimension, I would, you know, uh, put the dimension on the square and then work off of the end of this so that it's perfectly parallel. So that's pretty close in itself. I'm going to have to go in a little here. So if I look at this really closely, you know, I have a little bit of material left here. So I'm basically making this scribe line perfectly parallel to the opposite edge. Now I need to go ahead and plane that. I'll put it, go ahead and put a mark in this so you can see it. That's what I just scribed. Now one of the interesting things about this knife here is if you look at it really closely, it's a single beveled knife. And that single bevel allows me to, so that when I make a cut in this direction, it's flat on this side. So this cut that I've made is perfectly perpendicular and the bevel is going to the waist side. Okay, so we'll go ahead and put this in the vise. And I'm gonna put this in the other way so hopefully you'll be able to see the, uh, this scribe line start to flake away once I get close. I made it. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and check that. And that should be perfectly parallel this way and square, like so. And I'm a little out in that direction, so it's high on this side. I'm going to go ahead and move my plane to this side and make a couple of cuts that way in order to get it square. Okay, now these are the, the, uh, the more difficult cuts to make because if we're trying to get a dimension on a board, we want to make sure that we you know, work to those dimensions. And if you think about antiques, every one of these pieces of furniture that goes into this antique piece of furniture had to be prepared this way before they even started to put any curves or anything fancy into them. Now, the last thing that I need to do is to go ahead and make a, a uh, line that's parallel to the surface that we already started. So I'm going to introduce this other tool here which is known as a marking gauge or a cutting gauge. And if you look really closely here, what you can see is that the, the uh, knife on this is a knife and not a pin or a nail of any sort. And it actually has a couple of bevels on this side that is sharpened exactly like the knife that I was cutting with. Now when I set this up, I'm going to go ahead and choose the thickest or the thinnest part of the board. And I can micro adjust this by tapping it in one direction or the other. And I'm going to go ahead and make a score line here on the ends and then on the edges. the opposite end and on this edge as well. And you can see that scribe line. Now if you notice the scribe line on this side, you know, we got, you know, almost an eighth of an inch. It's just about touching at its thinnest point here. And on this edge here, there's very little. So this whole board is sort of tilted in this direction. It's really thick on this edge. So when I go to uh, plane this board now, uh, since I, uh, when I was planing this board in this direction to begin with, uh, one of the things, if you always remember to, to turn the board end for end this way, you're gonna be going with the grain on the opposite direction. And you don't want to be turning it from edge, edge to edge this way, always end for end. And that'll keep you 
you know, going with the grain. Now we'll go ahead and use a, a heavier plane to uh, get rid of some of these. And we'll just keep going until we get down close to our lines. And all the roughness is gone as well. And you notice making the cut side by side. Now if we look at our lines, probably should be, still got a little bit going on there, we're down to our line there, so we're going to focus more on this edge over here. And here we're also looking for flat, this way, and we got a little bit of a twist going on here, so I need to take material from this. I'm going to go ahead and finish this up with a smooth plane. Now if you look really closely here, you can notice that our scribe line is just about not quite taken away here and it's taken away over here. So I still have to take, you know, a lot more material from this edge because the scribe line is still there. Okay, we'll check this for parallel now. Set this to the thickness on each corner. That's looking pretty good. And good and flat. So now what we have is a board that's completely flat, straight, and square. And we have a little saying, if a board is flat, straight, and square, you're halfway there. Now, if you had a bunch more of these, you could certainly put them together to make a tabletop or, you know, a chest of drawers or, you know, they all start off with rectangular pieces. Whatever you're making, it always starts with a rectangular piece. And from there, we can put curves and so forth into it and we move on from there. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you practice at this, you get pretty good at it. And I, this is Phil Lowe at the Furniture Institute of Massachusetts and it's the art of woodworking. Mm -hmm.